Greetings, this is their reading of the book The Airship Golden Hind. Some of the language in this book has not aged well and is indeed no longer politically correct to take caution when listening to this visual audio book. Footage and photography are provided by Photations. At Photations, we believe that the world would be a better place if people spent their time being creative join us in practicing art so we all can be the master of art. Find art prints available at our store www.fortationstore.com. Keep our artwork alive by making a donation at fortationsdonations.com. The Airship Golden Hind Pie. Mercy F. Westerman. Chapter 664 Scores Count Karl von Senzig was certainly the first away. Typically Teutonic, he had succeeded in throwing dust in the eyes of his rivals, acting upon the principle, Do others, or they'll do you. He was leaving no stone unturned to pull off the big prize. And figuratively speaking, a good many of the stones were too dirty for a clean sportsman to handle. For one thing, von Sindic had obtained his airship by fraud, although none of the other competitors were aware of the fact formerly in the German air service. The Count managed to smuggle one of his Zeppelin out of the shed at Tundern, taking it by night to an aerodrome in East Prussia. According to the terms of the peace treaty, Germany, was to surrender all her airships. How she evaded the stipulation is now well known. The Zeppelins at Tondern and other air stations in Slesswood Holstein were destroyed by fire deliberately to prevent them falling into the hands of the Allies. This act of bad faith was similar to the scuttling of the Hun fleet at Scapa and the tardiness of the Allies to obtain reparation merely encouraged the Huns to other acts of passive defiance. But although the destruction of the airships was taken as an accepted fact, it was unknown outside certain junker circles that one of the Zeppelins had been removed before the conflagration. Revolutions and counter-revolutions in which the fire-eating von Sinzig had several narrow escapes from death, led the Count to seek pastors, new and about this time the publication of N. Jarvis's terms for the international contest suggested to the Junkard Count the possibility of making good his financial losses. Gathering a crew of airmen who had had experience in Zeppelin during the war on Sinsi flew the airship to Spain, crossing Austria and the north of Italy during the night, and carefully avoiding French territory on his aerial voyage. In a secluded part of the mountains Estremadura, he had practically his own way the Ogildas of the nearest surrounding villages were easily bribed to leave the mysterious airship and its foreign owner severely alone. From stores of German war material sold to Spain, von Sinzig obtained gas cylinders, petrol spares, and even a baby albatross, a small yet powerful monoplane with folding wings. This machine could with ease be stowed away in the car of the airship. With German thoroughness, the Count, looking well ahead, foresaw that the albatross would probably serve a most useful purpose in helping him to win the coveted prize. The honor of being the first man to fly round the world took quite a subsidiary place in von Sinzig's plans since Germany did not own a square inch of territory outside here. He was compelled to make use of alien lands in which to alight. That was a handicap, and the thought of it rankled there was some consolation to be derived from the prospect of wresting the big prize from a hated Englishman, a despised Yankee, or a miserable yellow Jap. And he meant to do it somehow. Already Germans had resumed their peaceful penetration of Great Britain and the United States 
commercial travelers representing German houses and at the same time potential spies were able to ascertain with little difficulty particulars concerning the British and American competitors for the round-the-world flight. The moment von Sinzik learned of the date of Sir Reginald Foster Dick's departure from England, he anticipated the time by starting the day before the British airship was supposed to leave Gibraltar. This was a comparatively easy matter according to the terms of the contest. Competitors had to obtain a clearance certificate from an official of the International Airways Board. Provided the flight were completed within 20 days of the day of the certificate, the principal condition was complied with, while it was furthermore specified that the certificate could be postdated to the extent of 12 hours to allow for the time taken up in transmission from the board's representative to the actual competitor. In von Sendig's case, he scored again employing a swift motor car. He obtained the official vest at Madrid and was back at the rendezvous within two and a half hours, the atrocious roads notwithstanding. Everything was in readiness for the start, and at ten in the morning, 64 left her shit and flying at a comparatively low altitude, made off in a southeasterly direction. The German was counting on 48 hours start of his English rival, possibly more. He had been informed that the cold in time proposed leaving England on the following Monday. Foster Egg really meant to have started on that day, and only the exuberant demonstration of the crowd outside Air Grange had made him alter his plans. It was a lucky stroke. For Foster Deck's secret intelligence department was at fault according to information received from Germany. Count von Sinzig was a non-starter. Incidentally, it was the Count who had set that rumor afloat. It was but one of the many petty artifices upon which he built his hopes of carrying off the Chavez Prize. Chuckling to himself, Count von Sinzig stood beside the helmsman of 64, quite in ignorance of the fact that a few thousand feet above him was the British airship, which he fondly thought was resting in her shed in far-off England.